Hello everyone and welcome back to our second tutorial about NVivo. My name is Dr. Anthony Cliff. Uh, and now we've done our first tutorial, which is looking at how to get your audio files into NVivo and how to transcribe it. Now we're looking about how to actually get some data from that, from your actual audio file and your transcription. Today I'm going to talk about thematic analysis. Um, for qualitative researchers, you may use different types of analysis, uh, content analysis, discourse analysis, grounded theory, ethnographic studies, there's so many. Um, so do go about looking about that. Um, but part of what I will discuss today in thematic analysis is the same across the, across the board, certainly for um, your coding and how you actually go about codes and making nodes and that kind of stuff. It's incredibly similar. But I thought I'd focus on formatic analysis. That's something I've done in the past um, and something I'm quite familiar with. So and you may well want to adopt that. I think it's quite a good way of going about analysis um, myself personally. So formatic analysis um, is a method simply for identifying, analyzing and reporting patterns, or as we call them in qualitative research themes within the data. Um, and it minimally organizes and describes your data set in rich detail. So for me, I often follow uh, somebody called Braun and Clark in their, um, in their methods and how they actually go about uh, doing thematic analysis. So it's important whatever you do decide to do that you know what the methods are. But typically for thematic analysis, there's certain steps, uh, certainly 10 steps to uh, thematic analysis. The first one is transcribing. So you would have, as we've done in session one, We've transcribed your data and you've checked for errors. And now we're on our second part now, which is our coding. So we need to generate some codes. We need to then check for any duplications and similarities and combine or delete them. Then we need to group our codes into subcategories and then finally have those codes into themes. Once we've got that, we can then go on to analyzing our data and then writing it up. So what do I mean then by codes? So popping back into NVivo, I've just taken a very quick snippet um, of one of my previous um, interviews that I did do. And I've just took a chunk of it here, just so I can go through and, and recode this with you as we go through step by step. So those of you from a quantitative background, you'll know that to get things into SPSS that we need to do some coding. Um, and that simply is when we give words uh, numerical values, and then we tell SPSS what those numerical, numerical values mean. And that's a code. We're attributing information to that particular number. Now, similarly, in qualitative stance, we've got words here, but we also need to attach some meaning to that um, and ways that we can later on go and group those kind of individual words so we can look back, give some meaning to that, uh, and depending on what type of analysis you're doing, you can either group them into themes, or for example, if you're doing content analysis, you can see how many times that particular word or phrase has cr cropped up and how it's been said, why it's been said across your entire data set. So this is something that NVivo is incredibly useful for. Um, some people will do this by hand, um, but I actually find this is a really good way of generating your codes is using NVivo. So what does this mean? How do we go about it? Well, first and foremost, you, you need to understand and know what type of coding that you're going to do. And this all depends on what type of analysis you're going to run and what type of researcher you are. So I've talked about it in some of my previous videos, but I'm a, I'm a pragmatist. I'm a mixed method researcher. And certainly for what this data came from here was part of a mixed method study where I conducted um, quite a large scale um, quantitative um, survey, analyzed all that data, used that as part of my results, but I also used the themes that are generated from that as some of the key points. And I then went and developed some focus groups and interviews off the back of that to find that. So I used the series of things called deductive and inductive coding. So the first one is deductive. And that basically means you already know what you're trying to find, and then you go through your data set or your transcript, 
and you attribute words and phrases that fit into that particular category or node as it's called. So for example, for me, I went through my entire questionnaire, looked at all the results and there's certain things that I expected to come up in my interviews because it was talked about in my questionnaire and certainly my results came about with that. So, so I had some things called deductive codes, things that I were looking for that was going to come up in my uh, transcripts. Other things are called inductive, which I also use, which is where you go through your transcript anything that you find interesting or relevant to your research question you code it you attribute it you give it a name um, and then that's how you do it so first and foremost then how do you go about doing codes whether it's deductive or inductive so the first thing we do is we look down here on the left hand side we have our things called codes now if we double click on the thing called nodes this will eventually once you've populated it list every single node that you've ever done that you've ever attributed to your particular data set now i'll show you a quick example of what that'll look like eventually so if you do thematic analysis eventually you'll end up with something that looks like this where you have all of your nodes all linked and grouped and as you can see here for example in my 3d model theme nodes I have 225 individual nodes and references within there. Why this is important and why we code and why we do that. For example, here I've grouped every time one of my participants mentioned using my 3D model that I created before Fieldwork. If I double click on that, give it a second. It then pulls up everything that I've coded about my participants bringing that in, talking about that. So I can read here that they're talking about it being a really potential good use before field work across numerous uh, relatively different interviews. I can then pull out those individual bits of data and then put that into my work and explain it and talk around it. So really, really useful using nodes because you can go back across your data set and pull things together. So back into here then, let's look about creating some deductive codes. So if you already know what you're looking for, then you need to click create and then node. And then simply you want to give it a name. So for example, my data set here, part of this was looking about this model, how it can be beneficial for their learning. So this might be anything. You might be, if you're looking at flooding, you might be looking at potentially, um, how something affects their mental health. Say if a previous flooding has occurred and you want to see how badly it's affected their mental health, but then you may be looking for certain different types of mental health. Um, so you may be looking at different things. You put that in here, you give it a name, you give it a description. And if you find that in your data set, you then put that across and I'll show you how. But for my codes, my first one I'm looking for is um, model is, is useful. So if my participant mentions that the model is useful to them in their learning, that's what I'm going to highlight. That's what we're going to put across. So model is useful. I'm going to click OK. And as I see here, um, this particular respondent said that they think it's actually really useful and that they're surprised at how useful it is. So that's a good quote to me. That to me, that is something that was useful for my work. So my participant saying that it's useful. Again, this could be anything that you've coded, anything that you're attributed to. Again, if this was flooding and they mentioned that flooding affected their mental health and particularly a certain type of mental health, highlight those particular words and phrases that they've said it. Right click, click code. <laughs> Go and navigate to where your node is, whatever name you get it. Click on it so it's highlighted and then click OK. Now, if we double click on that one, we can then see that that is now in here. If this pops up again, I will code it as the same, do the same process. Then I'll go back through my other assignments, uh, or sorry, other interviews or focus groups. And if this is put, this came across again in those particular ones, I will highlight it, add it into that particular node, and therefore across the entire data set, I can pull that across and have a look at where different things is. Now, what happens if 
that you don't know what you're looking for. You don't have any questionnaire data to back this up and you're doing some inductive. Well, then again, really, really simple to do. So let's have a look here. Um, let's have a look what we can code. Um, Okay, so my participant says that the model is really useful just before you go out into the fields because it's sort of intermediary. You've got that classroom learning, but you've also got a book that you should lay in front of it where this is somewhere in between the physical and the sort of little bit more tangible. So that's quite a nice quote there about how my model I've created for fieldwork um, can help them uh, in their learning, basically. So, so I may not have found that beforehand. This is something that's just come up. I've read about it. You highlight the words and phrases. Right click, code, new node this time, give it a new name. So I might say it's uh, beneficial, beneficial to learning. Click OK. That's now been added into that particular one. And that's simply all you do. If you've got deductive codes, then you go through your entire data set and match up words and phrases that match up under that particular heading that you've given that particular node. If you're using inductive, then you simply just go through and create loads and loads of different nodes. So if I pop back into my other data set, you can see here that I have hundreds of different codes that sit across my entire data set. Um, you know, all different things uh, that all are relevant that I found at first glance to be um, important now, the thing is, is that you go through, you can do as little or as many codes as you like. You are the researcher. You decide what you do, how you do it. There's no right or wrong way in qualitative research. Typically, I find that my first run through of a my first ever interview that I'll do, I'll code absolutely everything. Everything that I think that may be relevant to my research question. I will code it, I will give it a name you know, as here, and then later on, then after my second and third interviews that I've done, first and foremost, I'll look at, do they make sense? Am I getting the same, um, the same codes coming up, the same bits of data across my data set? If I am, then fantastic. If I'm not, then I need to potentially go back and have a look at my codes um, to see if I'm, I'm using the right phrases for my codes, am I fitting the right kind of phrases into those nodes? What's also important about coding as you go along, I personally think, is I think about saturation. Now, saturation in research is while we do qualitative research and we know that we need for a particular population X amount of questionnaires to come in to make our tests valid, in qualitative research it's a bit more subjective. And we typically use the rule of saturation. So what saturation means is if you start going through, you've run your first interview, you've coded it, you then go about to your second interview, you also code that. And by the time you get to your third and fourth, if you realize that actually your participants are saying exactly the same things, that you're not generating any new codes, there's no new information that are coming out that you think is relevant and interesting, then you've reached saturation. That's where you then stop. And that's when you would then stop your interviews and you would carry on with your analysis. Now, plenty of textbooks would say they give arbitrary numbers. They've literally picked this out of thin air. Again, there is no right or wrong answers. For my particular PhD, I reached saturation at just six interviews because it was quite a small, localized population. And I've done other projects where it was only on my 35th interview had I reached saturation. So it all depends on your project. So don't worry if you read about saturation. It's all subjective. And at the end of the day, as the researcher, it is your um, prerogative of when to stop your interviews, certainly when you think of time and money as well, uh, and access to participants. So what does it all, this all look like then? Well, again, what is the point of doing this? Well, you've gone about and you've coded all your data, you've highlighted what you think is interesting, you've right clicked it, you've added a new node, you've given it a name, and you've attributed some data to that. So for example, this paragraph here, their words, I'm saying they're, they're effectively just explaining that the model is useful. 
So that's going to be useful for later on because my hypothesis is that you know the model will be beneficial to their learning. But I can go back to this and I can pull out those quotes to support my argument. Now, once you've gone about coding and you've coded everything, you want to now get it into this format. You want to start generating themes and grouping them into themes. So to talk about that, for example, one of my chapters in my PhD was about um, UAVs. So UAV is the chapter. And then my sub chapters within or my subheadings, my next theme was about any advantages the, the UAV could offer. And within that, there were perceived benefits. And these are the four or five different benefits they, they got from that, that I got from my data. And certainly here, one of the really big advantages was that UAVs could enable students and staff to collect really good data from UAVs. So that's another theme. And within that is all those individual nodes which collectively all fall under this one heading. So to get to that point then, we need to do something. So once you've done all your codes, and again, as little or as many as you have, you want to click share and then export codebook. Make sure that nodes is ticked. Also make sure that you include number of files and references and then click okay. And what's that gonna do? is it's going to export all of your nodes into a Word file. So you'll generate a thing called a code book. So this is before that you generate your themes. So my code book for this over um, six interviews and a couple of focus groups was gigantic. So for example, here, here's my node title, that a 3D model is inclusive for disabilities. And my description about that, in case I forget what that means, simply meant any reference by my participants of the model being used for disabilities. And then simply any words or phrases that they use for that, I highlighted it and then added it to this particular node. What this means here is that that came up across two interviews and it was mentioned two times. Again, this data set or this code book is gigantic. Um, it's all in alphabetical order. Um, so, for example, here, um, what else have I got? Um, fieldwork skills are of a developmental value, um, which simply meant if the participant mentioned that fieldwork develops student skills base, I highlighted that particular phrase and I added it to this node, and that happened to come up across four of the interviews, and it occurred six times. So that's what a code book is. Now, if I go back to thematic analysis, so back to an automatic analysis, we've generated our codes in text. Now we need to do step three. Now step three is to check our codes for duplications and similarities and combine or delete them. Now, as I showed before, my code book, as you go through and you generate your codes, typically you'll generate them for your first interview and you'll give them all different names, etc. You then go on to code your second interview and you'll find something that you think is interesting. You'll highlight it. You'll right click it. You'll try to see if you've already got a node that fits that particular piece of information and then you'd add it to it. But sometimes you miss um, what what is in there and you code it again, but you give it a slightly different name. So, for example, um, I may say that um, Fieldwork uh, develops their skills as the title and then I might go on to my next interview I might see something that does say that and I can't remember if I coded it or not I try to find it you go a little bit word blind and then I type in fieldwork is valuable for skill development so it's the same principle it's the same information I'm putting but I've named it two different things but I'm effectively duplicating it you may also find that actually some of the stuff that you've coded isn't relevant anymore. So we need to combine them or delete them. And I'll show you how to do that if you do come across that. But first and foremost, I find this is where paper comes in handy. Now this doesn't work for everyone, but this is my particular way of how I got my head around it. And with something where I think Envivo isn't particularly good at is helping you to spot those errors and helping you to group those individual nodes into a theme. 
So what I did is I printed out that code book I've just showed you. And as you can see here, I scattered it across my, my floor in my office. And I went through individual ones to see if something was the same or if it was different or if I could combine them. So if something was very similar, I was talking about the same things, well, I could add them together. So I basically just laid the paper over each other and then I went back to NVivo and collapsed them or deleted them. I find it really useful for generating my themes as well by cutting them out. So here I had a, a post-it note, which I thought was the overall theme. So going back to that little example before, my overall theme for this bit is about fieldwork developing their skills. So my overall theme is that fieldwork develops student skills. And then every single node that I created that fits under this, that talks about different types of skills, um, anything relating to this particular overarching theme, what I'm going to be discussing, went underneath that. So therefore, when I went back into my Vivo, I could then start creating and collapsing down my data into these individual themes, which I could go out and discuss later on. I found this a really effective way. Many people I know have also done this. Of course, you can do this entirely digitally as well. But I found the actual act of moving nodes around under different headings and really getting you to critically think about what node goes where is a really important part of qualitative research and certainly helps you get a sense of your of your data and where it all fits in. So once you've done that then, what happens? Well, I'll show you how to collapse that down into NVivo. Okay, so back into one of my files. In one of my themes, for example, say that these two were the same, that you've looked through your code book and you found that these two are saying exactly the same thing. So let's just imagine that they were. So um, again, let's think this was about flooding, this is about mental health, and then you've coded um, two different types of mental health, the same, but just slightly different. Well, there's two ways of going about it. If you think they're exactly the same, and that you've coded them the same, then you can simply merge them together. Really simple. Click on your node, right click, click cut, Click on the node which you think is the same. You're going to merge them. So if we look here, it says that this one uh, was across five files and seven references were made. Right click, paste, and it's been added into there. Or you can simply right click and then merge. into selected node. This will pop up. Yeah, this is saying um, you want to merge them. Do you want to bring all of your, your memos across? Um, any relationships that you've done? Yes, that's all fine. Leave that as is. Click OK. And then we can now see that that's now been added into that file. Now, what if that you have to get to this point here, you need to start creating your themes. So how do you go about doing that then? So simply all the theme is, is what you're eventually going to discuss it. The way I think about it is my overarching theme is my, is my chapter or my overarching point. And then underneath that, each individual chapter, uh, correction, sorry, uh, each individual paragraph is a sub theme. And then to make up that paragraph, I have to talk about these individual things, which then make that up. So you know, imagine it like building blocks of a house. These are the little foundations and the bricks to then put them all together to then make that house. So to go about doing that is really simple. I'll just pop back into um, into my other file here. For example, say this was um, two individual nodes that you want to make into um, into your own theme. Really simple. Create node. And then let's give it a name. So let's just say this was, um, for example, we mentioned before about flooding. So let's just say this is um, mental health in flooding. Click OK. And then we want to right click this, cut, click on our new theme, merge into new child node, click OK. 
and then we want to call it mental health theme click OK oh, apparently so that my, my computer just switched off then so I have to redo this again sorry about that um, so simply to do it you need to click uh, node type in the new name or file um, that you want to give so your new theme so let's just call this theme one uh, flooding uh, mental health so imagine this would be our chapter that we'd be talking about so we've added that then imagine again we're talking about mental health this could be two different types of different mental health so that fits under that theme it's what we want to discuss but you want to add it under that theme right click cut click on our theme and then just click paste and as you can see it's now dropped under that theme similar for this one cut click paste now we have our theme there is mental health and flooding and this would be each individual type of mental health that was mentioned and if we wanted to we could just double click on that and that'll pull that up so again how that looks on a proper data set is for example here fieldwork's my main theme here's some of the disadvantages to fieldwork here's a, a really big paragraph i was discussing was about disability and then here is how that matches up to that uh, having to change a field to accommodate disability and then talking about individual disabilities on fieldwork i can double click on that so i can then talk about that i can pull these quotes across to support my argument of why fieldwork might potentially be a hindrance to um, disabled students because my participants have spoke about that and then it's up to my job then is to go through and look about look at that data and pull out some of those key quotes which are relevant to my particular argument so go through in vivo make your codes make as many or as little as you want and then start grouping them and generating them into themes because the themes are what are going to become your talking points in our analysis and writing stage, which I'll talk about in my next session. But one thing you should always be aware of is a thing called critical friends. Now, these aren't friends who discuss your fashion sense, for example. These are more academic critical friends. Now, what an academic critical friend will do, well, there's two different types. There is one where you generate your codes and your themes, you give them your code book and you show them bits of your data. You say, OK, here's one of my nodes and this is why I've coded it that way. And this is the information that I've put under that particular node. And here's my reason why for that. Now, by you having that discussion, it means that you're critically analyzing your data and you're critically thinking of why you've coded something in a particular way. Because it can be very easy to just code random different things, put different bits of information under different nodes, where actually the name of the node doesn't actually match up to the information that you put in there. So talking it through with a friend, called a critical friend, helps you ensure that you've not done that, that you're actually critically thought about that. The other critical type of friend is you give that friend be that a supervisor or someone else a fellow colleague your data set which has been uncoded they go away and code what they think the node should be and what information should go under and then you sit down and you compare and you'll decide on a number you may say if we have 70 percent of our codes the same and the same type of information is going in those nodes then i'm happy that i've done it correctly and we can carry on with the analysis. If it's not done, if you don't reach that agreed mark, then you both have to go back through and code it until you get to that 70%. I've never done it that way, but plenty of people do. I prefer just the critical friend because as the researcher, you know the data better than anyone else. By this point, you've gone and done the interview, you spent a couple of hours transcribing, and then a couple of further hours coding. So at the end of the day, you know why you've done something that way. So by you talking that through with someone, that satisfies the requirement in here, certainly on our analysis section, that 
you've generated the themes that subsequently generate enough data to answer the research question that the data that you've put in those nodes is the correct data. You've ensured that a critical friend has looked at it and it is sufficient. And that again here that you've analyzed the data rather than it being descriptive. So in our next one, we're going to look through then about how to analyze data and look at our different types of writing and how to actually write that and put that into a thematic looking uh, piece of research. So I hope that's useful. Um, coding is relatively easy, although there's easy ways, uh, harder ways and easy ways to go about it. This is just Envivo's way to go about it. Why theme generation is really important. So here is my code book, which now has my themes in. So why it's really important is, so for some type of researchers, when they're discussing their themes, they'll discuss what the most prevalent theme is. So if I go through my um, data set here, so this is quite a big one. Um, my overall theme was the pedagogical benefits, so simply the educational benefits that the model could offer students. That was discussed across the entire data set, and there's 108 individual nodes under this theme which match that. So if I look here, um, I've got um, my subheading was about pedagogical skill development. And in these individual nodes here, so the model is a really good learning boundary layer. It increases efficiency, productivity. It prepares students for fieldwork, um, and the model is used as a discussion tool. So all those individual nodes all add up and make up what I'm trying to argue for is that it does develop my uh, or does develop students. Uh, skills by using these models. So this is all my evidence here. And as I can see, this is quite a big part because there's 39 references to the model being a really good skill development. So I know that this was quite a pressing concern for um, my participants because they mentioned it 39 times across all of them. So same if you're doing, say, for example, um, again, let's use the flooding and mental health. If you find that particular mental health comes up all of the time, then that's something that you want to talk about because clearly that's a pressing concern for your participants. So having these numbers in here, so therefore if I've only got a certain amount of word counts or a certain paper, well then, yes, I want to talk about the pedagogical benefits of the model and there's 108 references to the model being beneficial, but I may decide that actually I'm going to focus on just the skill benefit of it. And I'm going to focus on just these individual pieces of information because that's the most that my participants have talked about. So that's really important. That's a good way of looking at your data because obviously if you've certainly if you've done a dissertation, you're going to collect a hell of a lot of data and data that might be useful and it might not be useful. And it's up to you to decide what you talk about. And that's always what research is about. And remember, you can always publish different papers on different projects um, by using this one giant data set. I find theme generation is really useful then to help me focus in what I'm going to discuss in that particular bit of research. So that's why you go about doing that. So like I say, our next session, I'm going to show you how to put that into a Word document. Thank you for joining.